Hello and welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth, brought to you by Grounded Press. My name is Dana Petrovic, and each week my guests, guests and I explore one aspect of Mother Earth and the gifts that she gives us. We also discuss why these gifts are so precious and why we should value them. We got you curious? Good. We love curiosity. Our topic today is likely one of the most complex ones on conversations with Mother Earth, at least so far. I refer to poetry. Let's start with history. The word per se, the word poetry is derived from Greek, poises, but the earliest written poems were composed in Sumerian, which was spoken in today's Iraq. We may remember from school days the epic of Gilgamesh. Egypt, Greece, Israel, India, the Roman Empire all contributed greatly to the field of poetry. Not to forget later works like Dante, Shakespeare, Lord Byron, and so on. The list is very long. And many later poets influenced our lives. When I look at my teenage years, um, I think Alexander Pushkin and Walt Whitman were the prominent ones. As we discussed in a second episode uh, with the best-selling author Yejide Kilanko, some of the oldest verses and lines were not even written down. Hence, I had what Germans call the Qual de Val, which translates into the agony of choice. Which focus should I choose in this endless sea of verses? I have decided to focus on Chinese and Arabic poetry for two reasons. They are some of the oldest poetry cultures on this planet. And secondly, some of the verses are so timeless, like Rumi's, that we still enjoy them today, some over 800 years later. And here is the sad irony of today. Rumi was born in today's Afghanistan, where poetry is being silenced again, along with many other voices. My two guests today are both scholars of literature. This is where the similarity ends though. <laughs> Dr. Mengwen Zhu is a junior fellow with the Society of Fellows in the Liberal Arts at the Southern University of Science and Technology. We call her University SASTEC here in Shenzhen, where I currently live and work. Professor Hamid Masfour is an associate professor of English literature and cultural studies at Sultan Moulay Sliman University in Beni Melal in Morocco. Ungwen and Hamid, welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you. So tell me, tell to our my listeners, what motivated you to study literature? Mengwen, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, in my case, as long as I can recall, literature has always been um, part of my passion, thanks to, to the influence of my, my late grandfather, who first taught me to recite classical Chinese poems. Uh, when I was barely reaching the school age, well, in China, that was before six. I, I couldn't. I couldn't have known then, but now in hindsight, whatever fascination and attraction I felt back then towards poetry and literature uh, must have stayed with me and grew over the years until eventually 
uh, I made the decision in my sophomore year as an undergraduate to follow my passion at, um, about poetry and switch my focus from economics major to literature. <laughs> I was studying economics actually, uh, but uh, I changed to literature. Well, I'm fully uh, devoted to studying literature uh, when I started my master's degree. So that's wow. my story. <laughs> Nice, nice. And Hamid, how about you? Yeah, actually, uh, as a doctor uh, and researcher in, in literature, uh, I can see that I started uh, uh, this nurturing, this interest in literature and especially in poetry since, uh, okay, since my teenage. Uh, at the time, I was uh, an avid listener to, to, to poets uh, broadcast on Moroccan TV or on some uh, other Arab channels. And I was uh, really fascinated also by the poems, by the score of poems uh, of uh, Arabic literature given to, to us in, in the class, in the secondary. Uh, in fact, uh, in the primary, preparatory and in, in secondary school. And uh, of course, uh, since my teenage, uh, I mean, uh, since these early years, I was uh, involved in writing poetry. Uh, oh, wow. I wrote lots. I, I wrote lots of poems, and uh, now, uh, besides being a researcher and a, and a professor of literature, I have also published three volumes of poetry: two in in, in Arabic and and one in English. And I have nice. others that I have not published yet in English. But also I found that uh, literature, uh, literature is very fascinating for lots of reasons, for lots of reasons. And uh, I can just say that literature is a window to different, or it's the window to understanding different human facets, be it on the local level or on the universal level. So poetry, is uh, a kind of a necessity of a necessity i deem it a kind of a necessity and uh, it's uh, not uh, a luxury but it matters in many ways especially in our world uh, in our world torn by wars torn by barbarism and torn by i can call it hatred mm -hmm. okay uh, poetry it bridges these gaps between cultures and it's, uh, let's say, um, make possible cultural encounters. Mm -hmm. That's what I can say. Oh, wow, that's nice. It will come to that topic. You mentioned a very important word. I will, I will uh, refer to it in just a moment. Before that, I want to ask you, you studied poetry and philosophy. How do you connect these two? I mean, that was your doctoral studies were in poetry and philosophy. What's the connection? Yeah, in fact, uh, in fact, poetry, uh, uh, I think, I think that there, that there are some common or meeting points between poetry and philosophy. Although philosophy asks questions and try to address them systematically, uh, poetry still is not a simple uh, practice for entertainment but it's uh, a serious practice, which is, uh, let's say, aiming to delve into the human condition, uh, to, let's say, explore the human condition with its effective uh, facets, with its, uh, uh, I mean, uh, concerns, both to the mind and to the heart. Uh, and although, although, let's say, literature does not show the systematic reasoning as, as, uh, as, it, as it is in philosophy. Literature, it can invent, it can invent, uh, I mean, worlds, it can invent situations. Through them, we can penetrate and we can scrutinize what's going on with the humans, with, the hum with, with, with humanity on different levels. It's interesting that you're saying that's very interesting. But let us just step, uh, take a step back briefly. Um, and I, I'm asking you the question but to which I actually know as an answer from my own experience, but I would still like to hear it. What is 
um, poetry. How is it different from prosa? Mong Ben, first. Uh, well, what is poetry? It seems a deceivingly innocent question. <laughs> and I'm sure it has been asked in different cultures, perhaps since the beginning of their respective poetic histories. But there is no easy answer. And I think it is a question that will continue searching for answers. Uh, but from the specific perspective you just mentioned uh, of the comparison between poetry as a genre and prose, uh, I can say that as far as the Chinese poetic tradition goes, one of the most fundamental differences is whether or not the lines follow a set of prosodic and rhyming rules. That's, um, well, of course, throughout our uh, poet history, the effort from poets and critics to distinguish poetry from prose tapped into other characteristics of these two genres. But fundamentally, poetry is uh, here, at least here in China, is recognized by its distinctive form of tonal pattern mm -hmm. and rhyming quality. Uh, so in Chinese poetic tradition, the sense of a clearer, uh, clearer genre distinction between poetry and prose actually only graduate, gradually appeared after the third century AD, when uh, the literary men started to consciously uh, seek the classification and definition of different genres. And for the long period before the third century, before that, the boundary between poetry and prose were actually more fluid. Okay. Uh, and during that time, it was a time that, that saw the uh, thriving of some kind of hybrid uh, genre, uh, such as the song, very long uh, ballad songs, and uh, and also, well, that's uh, some kind of the song from the southern part of China. Uh, in Chinese, we call it song, that's, uh, that's basically a kind of a type of song. And um, also, there is another genre that uh, in Chinese we call it fu. Uh, and that's also, well, it, it's very long, which doesn't resemble the poetry, uh, poems uh, of that time. But it's also, on the other hand, it's also uh, rhyme. So in that case, it's kind of a hybrid uh, genre. Uh, now, fu is. Uh, it can be translated in English into uh, rhymed prose, or okay. some scholars call it rhapsody. Yeah, the yeah, rhapsody. Yeah. Oh, nice. So, yeah, that's um, that's yeah. how I see it. Yeah. You mentioned you mentioned a very important word, deceivingly simple. It's it's deceivingly simple, and it's not simple at all. I mean, I write prosa, but I'm I I wrote only a few poems in my or have written in my career so far. So it's, you're right. It's deceivingly simple, yet it's 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 not at all. Hamid, what what is what do you think about that? What is what is poetry for you? Uh, well, poetry, of course, is as large as life. Yeah. And uh, even if even if Plato has chased poets from his Republic, uh, claiming that poets speak against the truth and they speak for, uh, let's say, uh, pleasure seeking ends, uh, I think that uh, poets uh, and poetry, of course, it is in the main, it is creativity. This is why they disturbed the project of Plato, because they can uh, create uh, and let's say proliferate new truths because uh, the perspective of poetry is a perspective of destabilizing reality. It tries to destabilize reality in an inventive way, transgressing of course what might restrict life, okay? It is revolutionary. It's an interesting, uh, interesting word that you use, the density. It's, that's exactly, I think that describes uh, poetry the best, the, the density of expression that you, that you have to compress in, in a certain form 
and of course in a certain yeah. in a limited space and limited use of words in the difference to when we write in prosa we can we can get descriptive we can we can be more yeah. more free um yeah it's it's a very good point um you mentioned uh hamid a moment ago also another important word in saying that poetry is a necessity and poetry is thankfully coming back into the center of the society. The inspiring Amanda Gorman's appearance at the inauguration ceremony for President Joe Biden helped of course with that, that we have poetry again at the forefront of the society, which it very rightfully belongs in my opinion. You both um, come from cultures where poetry has always been very respected. You, uh, Hamid, mentioned uh, television recitals. Um, when when uh, I, I, we both live here in China, where poetry is still very much respected. Meng um, Wen, first with you, um, when we look at the heydays of poetry here in China, and if I'm not mistaken, these were the uh, Tong and Song dynasties, how was that time? How, what was the time when poetry really thrived here? Uh, yes, you, you, you just mentioned the heyday of po Chinese poetry. And you're right, Tang and Song dynasties, which roughly lasted from the 7th century to the 13th century, uh, they have been generally considered the high time of Chinese poetry. And um, and this was a period when the thriving, also mentioned the poetry thrived during this time, the thriving of poetry during Tang and Song uh, was defined, in my opinion, it was defined by its maturity on many fronts. Uh, and this period, it, it actually follows a previously, also, I should say, thriving poetic era that for roughly three, that lasted for roughly three centuries. And that previous era, I also called it thriving. It's because it's not necessarily mature, but it, that, that time it's called the vital innovation and bold experiments and active transformations that would eventually lead to the well-known, more well-known Tang Song poetry maturity. And during the Tang and Song, poetry matured firstly uh, in terms of the institutionalization uh, that's because in early Tang poetry that that was uh, around seventh century, uh, mid seventh century, uh, poetry writing actually came to take play a part in the civil examination uh, for selecting the court officials. And as the role of poetry gradually gained the significance in the civil examination, it also rapidly matured in both content and in form. And then, uh, well, with the help of that, poetry becomes firmly ingrained in the general intellectual life. And in terms of uh, poetic form, Tang, especially Tang, well, Tang was the time when the pattern of the regulated poetry were settled, which required the poet to follow stricter and more detailed tonal and rhyming rules when composing a poem. Because I just mentioned, um, in pre-modern China, uh, to define what is a poet, what is a poem, it's, well, the form matters a lot. So we have to follow, uh, the poet, not we, the poet has to follow a set of strict rules in terms of tonal patterns, in terms of rhyming, um, rhyming, how, how to rhyme. So this actually matures during the Tang time. And in terms of song, actually, uh, I'm sure you know, there was a new, genre, a sub-genre of poetry emerging, that's the lyric, more lyric, lyric. We call it lyric, and in Chinese, that's basically uh, the poem uh, stand with music. That's also in terms of form, poem uh, also matures through, uh, from town through the song, entire song dynasty. And in terms of content and subjects, uh, that was the time when the the things that could be written into the po poem was unprecedentedly uh, broadened. So, from the uh, for for the po poetic subjects, they are uh, 
they can be uh, carried on with the conventional tropes such as like landscape, frontier, friendship, or love. And also the more interesting uh, aspects during the Tang Song po uh, Tang Song poems were that were actually those more novel subjects such as the tense occasions, domestic life, international uh, well, sorry uh, intellectual whims. And even the entertainment culture. Oh, so the yeah. <laughs> entertainment culture. Oh, well, that's well, both the traditional, more conventional tropes uh, themes, and also this more novel kind of subject. Uh, they are both well represented in Tang Song poems. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in, uh, when we talk about maturity, there were also the maturity of the artistry, uh, the broadening of the images, and the the better, like uh, Hamish just mentioned, the more density of the expressions of the uh, verse, and also the development of individual styles. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Well, it's, that's what I what I meant by saying the the poetry matured on many fronts during that time, and I that's what I consider most um, unique uh, characteristic of Tang Song poetry. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning uh, two interesting things. Um, yes, the, the maturity, the heyday, the, the peak of the, of the poetry cannot be happen be, be, without the fundament on which it was built. It had to, it had to grow. And uh, the other interesting thing that you mentioned is, is the requirement as the entrance exam to do recite poetry. I wonder what my students would, would say today if, <laughs> if they were required to recite poetry as, a, as an entrance <laughs> exam, I don't, I don't well, think the, all the... Actually, <laughs> the, 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 the uh, literary men, they, had, they didn't have, they, they, it's not that they had to recite a poetry, they had to compose poetry. Ah. <laughs> Hamid, tell us, tell us about the high heydays of the Arabic time. What kind of time was that when, when poetry, architecture, uh, literature in general thrived when art was, uh, of course, also math, mathematics. When all of that was, uh, was yeah, growing and thriving. Yeah. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, to say that uh, I feel inspired by uh, Manguin's uh, uh, okay information about uh, Chinese uh, poetry. I should start learning uh, about it. It's worth. Uh, <laughs> It's it's, it's 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 fascinating. <laughs> Tell you, Hamid, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah, surely. Well, uh, if we if we talk about uh, Arabic uh, poetry, we have, of course, to go back to the early to the early uh, the early times where Arabic started to de to, to to develop in the Arab uh, Peninsula. Uh, I mean. Uh, it's, uh, I think, one millennium before the birth of Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, in this millennium uh, before the birth of Jesus Christ, of course, uh, Arabic was a productive tool in the hands of, uh, of Arabs. Uh, this is what we usually call uh, Jahilit poetry or pre-Islamic poetry. And uh, pre-Islamic poetry, it is very, very rich. It, uh, it dealt with uh, a context, a historical context, and the social context, which is marked by the unit of the tribe as the main social and cultural unit. Uh, and this means that the tribe, of course, counts uh, more than the individual. The individual is there in the service of the tribe. There is no individualism. There is just the tribal spirit to, uh, let's say, to serve, uh, for, okay, with all efforts and by all means. And there's, uh, there was also this Bedouin life, this Bedouin life, this nomadism. Uh, it was a nomad society and uh, they lived within uh, an austere and a hostile, let's say, geographical context and a hostile weather which is too hot. 
but despite this uh, this austerity of the of the climate and of the of, and, and of the geography, of course, the pre-Islamic poetry boasted really very marvelous and uh, timeless verse, indeed, which is still, uh, let's say, taught in uh, in Arab schools and which. Uh, Yes, this, this timeless poetry of pre-Islamic poetry, of course, uh, it, it shows the greatness, uh, the artistic greatness, of course, and the thematic. Uh, there are different themes, themes of love, themes of courage and bravery, uh, themes of friendship, uh, eulogy, satire. Uh, it was a variety uh, of, of themes. And also, there were very great artistic artistic patterns, uh, and of course, the representative of pre-Islamic poetry is al-muallaqat. We call them al-muallaqat in Arabic. Uh, al-muallaqat. Uh, these were, let's say, canonic canonic poems, very long poems that were hung on the Kaaba. The Kaaba. Wow. It is the worshiping. Yeah, uh, and of course, these are canonical uh, poems. After pre-Islamic poetry, which was uh, great on all levels uh, of greatness, of artistic greatness, uh, after that came Islamic poetry. With Islamic poetry, there is a kind of waning in, in the artistic level, uh, because the main aim at the time was not uh, what was artistic, but uh, the, the main aim was to, let's say, put poetry in the service of the Islamic cool. Or, I mean, uh, it was, uh, I mean, poetry, uh, the poet was, uh, was restricted from talking about wine, talking about uh, women, talking about uh, love and talking about other issues because the Islamic school or the religious school was what makes poetry, uh, I mean, uh, this, this restricted poetry, especially with the poet Hassan ibn, ibn, ibn Abi Tabit. Huh? Hassan ibn Abi Tabit was, uh, was of course, uh, an Islamic poet who put all his poetry to the service of the Islamic call. Mm -hmm. But it was, according to different critics, it was, uh, let's say, um, poor in quality. Islamic poetry during the time of the Prophet was of poor quality uh, if it is compared with pre-Islamic poetry. But again, with the Abbasid, with the Abbasid era or the golden era of, of uh, the Arab empire, of course, uh, the, there's going to be prosperity on different levels, on the cultural, on the economic level. And there's going to be, of course, uh, an, inter an intercultural, uh, let's say, uh, atmosphere uh, where, where, the, uh, where, where Arabs, of course, mingled with different cultures with the uh, Indian, with the Persian, with even Chinese culture, with all the cultures, because with the, uh, with, uh, yes, during the Abbasid era, there was uh, established uh, Beit al-Hikmah, or what we can call in English, uh, the House of Wisdom. It was an institute, which was uh, an establishment, uh, okay, the aim of which was, let's say, to translate all uh, the traditions, all the cultures, the philosophy, the science, the poetry uh, from India, from China, from Greece, from uh, Persia and different parts of the world. And at the time, poetry, of course, will blossom. It will uh, be uh, a kind of a craft, okay? Uh, what we call in, in, in Arabic, shar sana, a kind of a craft on the level of uh, inventing new meters, new prosody, uh, new rhyme schemes, new uh, metaphors, and and new ways of uh, what we call poetic diction. The show is called uh, Conversations with Mother Earth. Yeah, right. Uh, how is that connected with poetry? Mengwen, uh, do you want to uh, Mengwen, oh, yeah. do you want to um, start first? Sure. Uh, I mean, Mother Earth. I, I I will continue to speak about Chinese poetry. Of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> but for Chinese poetry, from the very I wouldn't say 
maybe the very beginning, but from very early on, when uh, critiques or well, the early earlier like Confucius masters, they started to try to define poetry. Um, from that early, uh, Mother Nature has <laughs> been regarded a vital factor in creating poetry, actually. So it was thought that poetry, poems, were produced out of a stir of feelings inside a poet. But for the poet to, to be able to articulate these feelings, he needs to, he needs to be triggered by certain phenomena in nature. For example, uh, so if there is a poet, uh, he might feel the homesickness. Um, but the poem on his homesickness would mostly, most likely come into being. Uh, imagine this thing when he saw a full moon hanging in the nightly sky and shining upon his own uh, lonely shadow. And in this case, the natural phenomenon of full moon would trigger his articulation of homesickness and result in the composition of the poem. So that's basically, and in the early times, how uh, we think poetry uh, comes into being. And of course, later on, uh, around the four, fourth century, from the fourth century AD on, uh, there evolved an entire subgenre in classical Chinese poetry known as the landscape poetry. In Chinese, we call it, we call it shan shui shi, that literally means the mountains, poetry on mountains and waters. <laughs> so these kinds of poetry, they would exclusively focus on depicting the natural scenery, um, mostly the mountains and the water. <laughs> it's exactly like the one I, uh, I recited last time when we met about that um, empty mountain. It's, a, it's also, that was a very typical uh, landscape poetry. So that's, I think, uh, with considering Chinese poetry, the connection with Mother Nature, there is just, um, it's too much. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, they are inseparable. They are they, that's, um... inseparable. There is, uh, Hamid, can you, can you say that there is no poetry without nature? Um, I think that, that nature is uh, omnipresent in poetry. The poet uh, tries to identify with, uh, with nature so, so as to express uh, lots of, uh, of concerns. Uh, in, 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 in Arabic poetry, of course, uh, the presence of nature, it dominates. Uh, it dominates uh, the poems. If you go to pre-Islamic poetry, for example, uh, with uh, Zuhair ibn Abi Salma, or with uh, Taraf ibn al-Abd, or with Kumait, or with uh, other poets such as Shanfara, for example, you're going to find the presence of the details of the, of, of, of the desert, the details of the geography of the desert, yes. and, the details, and the details of the harsh weather you're going to find that. But also, you can find also in, uh, I think, in, uh, in Islamic uh, poetry, I mean, in, in Andalusia, you find, you, in, uh, in Islamic Spain, of course, you can find lots of, of poems which are, let's say, described in nature, which are, uh, let's say, uh, dealing with nature as, uh, I mean, as a condition, as a condition of, of human happiness. Yeah. Uh, also, you find in, find in modern poetry, you find the, the presence of, uh, of nature, uh, uh, okay, with the movement of romanticism, especially with Sayyab in his uh, very, very uh, time honored and timeless poem, Al Masa. Uh, it means the, the evening. Uh, it was, uh, yes, it is a very great poem. Uh, where, 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 we f where, where we feel the presence yes. and the dominance of, of nature. Also, we find that uh, with, uh, with uh, I mean, uh, the Arab poets of what we call the Arab poets of Al Mahjar. These are poets, of course, who have uh, migrated to America, especially to America, uh, especially Gib uh, Gibran, Khalid Gibran. Okay. Oh, yes, Gibran, Khalid Gibran, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd like perhaps to to uh, yes to quote some some lines uh, that show this um, let's say this celebration of nature. Yes, 
He says in one of his poems, give me the flute and sing, for singing is the secret of existence. And the wine of the flute remains after existence ends. Have you inhabited the jungle like me, a home instead of palaces? I followed the streams and climbed the rocks. Did you take a bath in with perfume and dry yourself with light? And don't drink wine from ether cups. Give me the flute and sing. For singing is the secret of existence, and the wine of the flute remains after existence ends. It's etc. So yes, uh, you, have, uh, yeah. Yeah, you have, yeah, uh, you have, you uh, have heard many times uh, details, details from nature, like the jungle, like uh, have you the streams, have you climbed rocks, uh, dry yourself with light, uh, etc. So this is not a luxury. This is not a luxury. I mean, this is not. Uh, I mean, integrating nature was not, uh, let's say, a superficial additive, but it was, uh, let's say, a cornerstone in, let's say, uh, approaching uh, a certain deep, profound dimension of reality around the poets and nature yes. served Arabic Arabic literature yeah, to yeah. show. Uh, to show and deal with different teams. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, I, I completely agree because when we talked a few episodes back, when we talked about dance, um, my uh, Pablo mentioned, for example, this almost this cosmic connection to the source, uh, to, uh, to the inspiration in music and dance. And you're bringing that earlier also, Hamid, with mysticism and inspiration. And of course, we we have that inspiration, uh, overall inspiration, but also this inspiration from Mother Earth. We, 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 our soul drinks so much beauty that we don't know what to do with it. We have to pour it into, into words. We have to make sense of it because it's, it's so overwhelming and it's so incredible. Um, thank you for, for reminding us of Khalid Jibran, of course. I love him. He's, he's extraordinary. Um, and um, of course, we are covering here a huge area geographically, and we are traveling in time a lot. So uh, <laughs> there is so much to discuss about this topic. Um, and we could go on and on and on uh, about this, but let us uh, come slowly to the end because you just recited your favorite, you recited Khalid Gibran um, and the beautiful poem. Mengren, um, do you want to recite your favorite poet? Of course. Uh, well, this is one of my favorite poems. So this is a heptasyllabic, uh, so seven syllable lines uh, with eight lines. Heptasyllabic regulated verse composed in the ninth century by a poet by the late Tang, also from Tang period, by a late Tang poet by the name of Di Shengyi. So I love this poem mainly because of it being such an enigma. <laughs> it is heavily elusive. It is filled with charming images. Uh, but shortly since its composition, readers and critics, they have started an un unending debate on exactly what it means. Some say it's a love poem, and some argue that it concerns music, and still others think it, con it, it contains a hidden intention to vent political frustration. <laughs> and uh, well, the discussion goes on. Oh. Although uh, it's, still, it's still ongoing nowadays among scholars, there is no definitive um, answer. So although on the surface, judged by the couplet it starts with, it simply depicts a painted zither, and zither being a traditional string uh, instrument in China. In China. So I will receive Cite this poem in Chinese, and I will also give uh, an English translation. So the Chinese okay. goes like, "Ah, uh, 景色李商隐，景色无端五十弦，一弦一柱思华年，庄生晓梦迷蝴蝶，望帝春心托杜鹃，苍水日有泪。”白云日暖一溪烟，此情可待成追忆，只是当时已惘然。So this is the entire poem, and uh, I'm I will share the version, the English version translated by myself. This poem being so famous, 
well, it's been so famous. It's been uh, already being translated and retranslated over and over again. But I would like to share my own version. <laughs> so uh, here it goes. Uh, the Painted Zither by Li Shangying. The Painted Zither, for no reason, 50 strings. Each string, each fret, recalls a blooming ear. Master John's dawn dream, a butterfly lost. Emperor Wang's spring love, a cuckoo found. The indigo sea, moonshine, tears fall from the pearl. The blue mountain, sun bathed, smoke rises in jade. How could one wait? To remember this feeling when at the time he was already bewildered that's the entire poem nice wow beautiful beautiful oh, thank you i'm glad you like it <laughs> very very beautiful <laughs> you're right it's very enigmatic and hamid uh yes. do you have uh another short one for us yeah, I'll uh, i'll read a short poem by uh or uh, let's say extracts from uh, Arumi, okay? Uh, from uh, his uh, Masnavi, or the spiritual couplets. Uh, so Arumi, uh, okay, tries in this poem, of course, to talk about the oneness, the oneness of the universe. Yes. And, and he finds that this oneness, we cannot live it fully without love. It's only through love that we can share this oneness between us and between everything else. Uh, so uh, he says in his spiritual couplets, that's just an extract. I died to the mineral state and became a plant. I died to the vegetal state and reached animality. I died to the animal state and became a man. Then what should I fear? I have never become less from dying. At the next charge forward, I will die to human nature so that I may lift up my head and wings and soar among the angels. And I must also jump from the river of the state of the angel. Everything perishes except his face. Once again, I will become sacrificed from the state of the angel. I will become that which cannot come into the imagination. Then I will become non-existent. Non-existence says to me in tones like an organ, truly to him is our return. Oh, thank you. That's, that's, that's very beautiful. That's, that is um, a perfect, uh, perfect ending. Dear listeners, um, this episode has been a little bit longer I will conclude with my favorite poem is actually one written by a German poet, Josef von Eicherdorf. And this poem is called Mondnacht, Night of the Moon. You can find the translation online. I like to recite it in German, so I won't do it today. But since I'm in China, I will recite the most famous Chinese poet, Li Bai. And he is very his timeless verse called Thoughts on a Tranquil Night. Before my bed, a pool of light, or can it be frost on the ground? Looking up, I find the moon bright, bowing in homesickness, I am drowned. And this is what you mentioned earlier, Mengwen, with the homesickness and all these feelings. And the funny thing is, when I read this poem by a Chinese poet, I, um, I miss Europe. Isn't that fascinating how poetry connects us and how poetry actually does not know borders, does no political borders, poetry defies. Yeah all borders and we today in this at some bit longer conversation show that this is the case. In closing, there is one more thing to say to both of you. Mangwan, Sheshe, Hamid, Shukran. Shukran, thanks.
thank, thank you, you for, for joining. Me. Thank you for joining Conversations with Madre today. It was my pleasure to have me. So, dear listeners, this was today's conversation with Mother Earth brought to you by Grounded Press. Poetry is and always will be a timeless verse. Next week, I'm taking you to a magical place that inspired poets, prophets, architects, everybody. We are going to experience oneness. We are going to dive into the deep sea. Stay tuned.